morning, beloved. Uh, welcome to Christ Church. I'm Pastor Ryan, and this is Jackie. And we are happy to invite you into our home this week uh, to join us online for Church Online. We're excited that October is such a good month. I'm so excited. <laughs> There's so many good things coming. So next week, um, October 11th, we are gathering. We're gathering. It's going to be so exciting. And we know that gatherings are not what everyone can do right now. So we actually are still providing three options for church. This option, which is online, maybe you're by yourself watching, tracking with us online, or maybe you have a group of family, friends, or your little bubble you meet with as a home church. Those aren't moving, they're staying there. We're gonna continue to put those up, um, receive them the same way that you have, or you can come down to Nanu's place in Oceanside here and you can meet with us. And that's at 10 o'clock on October 11th. And we've sent out emails. If you haven't received that email, it has all the protocol, um, kind of of what the COVID things are, um, but it's all out there. It's coming next week, it's exciting. And then the other thing that's happening in October is pilgrimage is starting. So October the 19th, right, <laughs> is our first uh, putting out curriculum for pilgrimage. So if you are interested, it's just a beautiful time. I'm excited. I actually, you know, we've done this so many years and I've just felt God's invitation to go, let's talk about the gospel again. And he, every time it's new, it applies to my current life. It reflects on my past and puts hope into my future. And so it sounds so cheesy, but that's what it does every time. <laughs> So I just really invite you guys to come. You won't regret it. It's a year kind of just to meditate on the Lord's word and his truth and Jesus' life. And so come join us. October 18th uh, is our last day oh. to sign, to get in, because on October 19th, we're going to start. So there's lots of different ways to interact with that material. So we can send you information if you like. Yeah. Sounds good. Yep. <laughs> um, our psalm this morning to continue in our worship is Psalm chapter 80. And so if you can turn there in your Bibles, uh, we will prepare our hearts uh, to worship the Lord together. I'll start reading in verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stalk that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire, they have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. So Father, in the same way we pray to you as our shepherd, you know our plight. You know the difficulties of this time and this season. You know the particular struggles that each one is facing. But having spent months 
scattered as your church, unable to gather in the ways that we used to, we cry out to you and we ask that you would restore us, restore all that has been lost in our hearts and in our minds and and in our bodies. Restore what's been lost in regards to our community and our communion together. Lord, we ask for your strong right hand, your beloved son, Jesus, whom you have made strong for yourself to respond to our needs today, our weaknesses and our brokenness. Respond by letting your face shine upon us that we would be saved. And so, Lord, we come to you with humble, needy hearts today, looking to see in the face of Jesus our salvation, our encouragement, our comfort, and our strength. And we pray this in his most glorious name, the name of Jesus. Amen.
A wave tossed in the ocean, a river in the wind stealing, hear me when I'm calling, how'd you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. Heavenly Father, we ask that according to the work of Jesus, that you would send out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon your word. Lord, as we manage our anxieties about this life and this world, our anxieties about gathering together as a church, as we hold all of these things Lord, we ask that you would give us the very spirit of Jesus, that in doing so, you would give us the heart of Christ, the mind of Christ, the mouth of Christ, and the hands of Christ. That as we work towards gathering together, you would be present and glorified in our midst. And so, Lord, as we open these scriptures today, we ask that you would lead us according to Jesus, into Jesus' likeness. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is again going to be from the book of Philippians. So you can turn there, Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to begin the reading in verse 12 through to the end of 17, though I won't be preaching through all of those verses. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. This is our story, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as I said last week, I wanted to spend a bit more time in these texts in Philippians because they seem to suit well um, getting our hearts ready for gathering back together in person. The reason they're so helpful is because they call us to fix our eyes purely upon Jesus and to follow the way of Jesus. In the previous verses that we looked at last week, this is what Paul pushes the Philippian church towards, is that they would be united in affection and sympathy and encouragement in Jesus and that they would be of the same mind together, that they would be in full accord and of one mind, doing nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. It's a helpful picture for us to see how following Jesus, as we all hope and claim to do, actually looks like Jesus in the life of the church that we put the needs and the preferences of others above our own needs and our own preferences because we can be confident that our needs and all that we long for in this life will be fulfilled by our Heavenly Father himself. And so Paul looks actually to model this 
for his people, as we read in verses 17 and 18, is that he says it's his joy that if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul is actually in prison when he writes this letter to the church in Philippi. And he's preparing for a potential and quite you know, likely execution for his faith in Jesus. And so it's his, he's saying he is glad and he rejoices at the opportunity to lay down his life for the good, uh, for the goodness of the faith of the Philippian church, that's profound, and so Paul sets up a standard for us, a vision of which to say the leaders of the church, the most mature amongst you, should find gladness and rejoicing at the opportunity to lay down their preferences for the good of the faith of those underneath them. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what the church is meant to be? And so for us as a church, as we are managing COVID season <laughs> and everything that's going on there, it also happens to fall in the midst of our kind of rebuild and relaunch of Christ Church. Had COVID never happened, we would have continued as we have, but we would have been moving more and more as a parish towards missional thinking. And by that, I mean the our, our church, Christ Church, has made the decision, you know, 10 years ago or longer to give up all sorts of comforts and preferences for the sake of safeguarding our orthodoxy. And what we mean by our orthodoxy is our essential um, things that we believe about our faith. And we weren't willing to compromise on the gospel of Jesus. And we're even willing to lose our building and all, all sorts of other comforts and strengths and, um, of this world in order to hold to the gospel not change the gospel that we had inherited, but instead give up and sacrifice all sorts of comforts in order to maintain it. And that's a beautiful part of our history, that we lost a, a beautiful building that we loved in order to not lose the main thing, which is the gospel of Jesus. Now, as we seek to relaunch Christ Church to Oceanside, it's with the heart of taking that thing that we have safeguarded, the way of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, the faith handed down to us in the scriptures and according to the creeds Catholic. We're taking that orthodoxy and we're looking to move forward in our orthopraxy. What orthopraxy means is how we walk out, how we act from our orthodoxy. And so our good news message that we've safeguarded, we're now looking to step boldly and publicly into, into the Oceanside and the island and to proclaim that good news in mission, in evangelism. For all those who need to hear the good news of Jesus, we want to live that out in such a way that they will hear it. And we want the whole life of the church the way we function, the way we carry our values, the way we live out our beliefs to serve others entering into that same way of Jesus. And so as we take this month of September to go, what's our blueprint? What are we building here? We're also answering the question, if we're building a Christ that is, or a church that is founded on Christ, then we also want every individual to seek to live out their life according to that same Jesus. That we want everything we do as a church to serve those who don't know Christ to come to know Christ. And anything that might get in the way, though we might find it comfortable, and our preferences, 
we are quick, joyful, and glad to lay down for the sake of the faith of others. So as we look at this text, this is what Paul continues to lead this parish in Philippi into, as he wants them to walk more into it. So verse 12, therefore, my beloved, again, the affection of Paul for his people, as you have always obeyed Jesus, as you've always walked in the way of Jesus, even though it meant losing so many comforts of this world, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to obey Jesus. To continue to hold to that, we're not going to compromise on our orthodoxy. But instead, we're going to walk out our orthodoxy in practice. We're going to make hard decisions in line with our belief about Jesus. And he says specifically, the way I want you to do that is to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the way that a church continues to live out their orthodoxy, continues to follow the way of Jesus in action, Paul says the first thing is you got to focus, you got to um, train your focus to be on you and you walking out your salvation with fear and trembling. Too often in the church community, it can be really easy to focus on everybody else, to focus on what we think should happen in the church, to focus on what should be the particulars and the administrative and the all these things. We can get bogged down. I mean, if you read through our safe the procedures for COVID, you'd find yourself, it actually wants to consume all of your thinking. And you're going, okay, I found this in the last few months going, how do we do this? How do we make sure we don't mess anything up? How do we make sure people are safe? It's easy to get distracted. What we want though, is we want to stay focused on the main thing. And the main thing Paul is pushing for is your participation and enjoyment of the gospel, your salvation. And so he's pushing them, work out your own salvation. Take personal responsibility for it to unpack and to apply it. This is why I think something like the pilgrimage should never be something that we tire of doing. We always want to be journeying in the way of Jesus, further seeing him, further receiving him. And to do this with fear and trembling. Now that's not language we use too often in a positive light. But Paul here is saying that that's important. To walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so in case in any way our secular world influences the way you read this, in case you misunderstand, Paul's not saying your salvation is up to you. So make sure you take full responsibility for it. And you decide what you believe about it. And you determine how you want to accomplish it and all of that. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, take responsibility to make it your focus and your value. To give it a high priority in your life. And to do so with fear and trembling. And the fear and trembling means that it's actually carefulness and respect for the fact that what he's going to say in verse 13 is that Jesus does all the work. So you've got to respect the fact that God is the one who achieves your salvation. And so the trembling looks like deferring to Jesus. That we're like, we're walking and following Jesus, but we're always keeping our eye on him. We don't want to get distracted. We don't want to be more focused on what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. But instead, I want to always be looking to Jesus to make sure. If you've ever you know, been with somebody really important or traveled with them, or maybe you worked at a job where the CEO came and visited, everyone's always kind of watching his response to things, watching how he's perceiving everything. We want to have Jesus as our center in the same way. Always going, is this good? Is this line up? You like this? Because Jesus is our focus. 
which brings us to verse 13. Walk out um, your, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. It's God who's going to be doing this work inside of you. He's the one responsible for achieving it, both to will, which is to create the desire inside of you for change and for transformation and for more Christ-likeness, so Jesus is going to initiate that will in you and Jesus is going to accomplish that work in you. So you might find as you're focused on Jesus, you start to realize, man, the way I'm thinking or the way I'm acting or the way I'm reacting to my life right now is not in line with the way of Jesus. I'm actually fighting and scrambling to keep things for myself instead of freely giving things away. When we notice those things, as we look at the face of Jesus, it's his, it's him inside of us stirring the desire for change, the will for change. And when we find ourselves going, I want to change in this place. I want to grow into more Christ-likeness. I want to be nearer to him, more beloved to him. I want to feel those things. Then we find, okay, how do I achieve that? And the answer for Paul is that that will and that desire that you suddenly have, you don't actually achieve that. Instead, it's the person and work of Jesus that accomplishes the very thing that he's initiated in you to start to desire. And we can see that in God, in his, in the Trinity. We see God the Father wills for you to to be saved, we see the Son accomplishing that work for you to be saved, and the Holy Spirit applying that work to you, that you would enjoy that salvation that Jesus accomplished and the Father always desired and designed for you to enjoy in Him. So it's God who both wills and works within us the change and ch transformations that we most long for. And so a church then that knows this, believes in this, holds to this, would have a culture actually of, that would provide a few things. Number one, we're going to provide as a parish a culture that's always focused on God. God is the main doer in our midst. God is the person we want you most to interact with. God is the one we are putting all the responsibility on to accomplish miraculous works. So we're going to have a Jesus-centered culture when you walk in on a Sunday. The second thing, though, is that if we know that Jesus does all the work, then we're also going to be a people that, live, that seeks to provide safety. Safety for hard hearts, self-protecting hearts, defensive hearts to relax. <laughs> relax so that Jesus can do the work. So we don't want to get in the way of you and Jesus. We're going to actually have a posture of serving and deferring, always pointing you to Jesus. Because it's not us that's going to save you. It's not us that's going to be your personal savior. It's not us that's going to create the transformation. So we're not saying follow our rules, be like us. We're saying follow Jesus, be like Jesus, let Jesus do the work that you most desperately need. So we're going to have a Jesus-focused culture in our church, and we're going to seek to provide safety. And then the last thing that I think is as helpful to mention is that we want to give lots of time for you to get to know Jesus, to receive Jesus, and be transformed by Jesus that we're not putting a ton of pressure on you for instantaneous transformation. You know why? Because we trust that Jesus is going to do the work. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And so we want to give time and space for that. A.W. Tozer has a great quote. God never hurries. There are no deadlines against which he must work. 
Only to know this is to quiet our spirits and relax our nerves. Doesn't that speak to the kind of culture we want the church to have? Really confident in Jesus. Always pointing you to Jesus. A safe environment for Jesus to work in your heart. And we're not going to get our fingers in and mess it all up. And also time and space to heal, to grow, and to walk into all that Jesus has for you. Isn't that lovely? And the result of this kind of culture, Paul would say, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And that's what we want. We want to be a player, a parish of God's good pleasure over us. That there's this sense of like, God loves this because it's all about Jesus. It's safe for broken people to come into. And that there's this sense of like relaxation because we know that Jesus has this. Isn't that an interesting kind of paradox to go, Paul's saying, walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. Take personal responsibility for it, but know that God's going to do all the work and have a culture that's defined in our parish by that, for his good pleasure. So focus on you. Don't get bogged down in all the other details that are going on in our church right now. As we figure things out, don't get distracted from Jesus. So focus on you and your salvation. Focus on Jesus being responsible to create all the miracles and accomplish all the work that he has designed for Christ church. Thirdly, verse 14, focus on unity. Okay, do all things without grumbling or questioning. That's the next piece that Paul's going to say, look, if you're focused on you and you're focused on Jesus, then that should produce in us a community that's focused on unity. Because we do things without grumbling and without questioning, that we're really just focused on Jesus. Jesus never resisted humility, sacrifice, service, or even suffering. All of those things Jesus never resists. He never goes against the Father in that regard to protect himself. Instead, he joyously trusts the Father to lay down his life for the good of others. So we want a parish that is focused on personal reception of Jesus, so needing Jesus. We want a parish that's focused on Jesus doing all the work. We want a parish that is focused on maintaining the unity so we're not grumbling and questioning based on the sacrifices we have to make in this season. And then lastly, because I'm running out of time, verse 15, we want to be a church that is focused on mission. Because a people that don't grumble and question in laying down their lives and following Jesus become a people who are blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. Blameless and innocent in our trust. We become the opposite of blameless and innocent when we go our own way and insist upon our own way. That's when we fall into sin. When we go, I need this, I want this, I will demand this. Today is Wednesday when I film this, and the morning reading is James chapter 4. And he warns against that very thing, that that very type way of thinking leads to sinfulness. But instead, we want to be trustful children, and in trusting him, we end up becoming, as a product, blameless and innocent, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. And isn't that true of our time? Crooked and twisted, bent on our own self-provision, our own grasping at power, our own self-determination. Instead, a humble, trusting Christian looks like one that trusts their father. 
knows they have a good father, knows that they need to be focused on receiving their own salvation, and then ends up serving the community by only speaking about Jesus instead of grumbling, complaining, and questioning. So I'd ask this question, what's coming out of your mouth these days? Are you grumbling? Are you questioning? Are you raging against losing comforts and preferences? Or are you instead going, my eyes are fixed on my own need for Jesus. My eyes are fixed on the perfection of Jesus' work to save me. And my eyes and my mouth is determined to only speak of confidence and faith and love in my community of Jesus. Lastly, what Paul says this leads to is in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, we will then shine as lights in the world because it's different. It's a different way. When, when we're focused on my need for Jesus and focused on the perfection of Jesus as our King and Savior and focused on only doing what benefits others, that couldn't be more different than what's going on in the world. Because what's going on in the world is people are blaming everyone for their problems. People are looking to, to worldly seats of power to provide for them. And so have become polarized in their quests. And then they are constantly grumbling and questioning everything, angry at everyone, competing with everyone. And if you read Facebook, you'll see it. You'll see it. Now, I'm thankful I don't see a lot of that in our parish, but I want us to stay aware of that fact. Instead, we want to be a people that shines brightly in goodness, in kindness, in love, in patience, in deference, in humility, and in serving the good of others in the world. That we will shine as lights in the world through that focus on Jesus. So here again, these last um, few phrases that we, that we will see that if we hold fast to the word of life. That's our orthodoxy. We hold fast to the scriptures because they contain the good news of Jesus. And we'll need to hold fast to them because when we lose things we like and lose things we love and lose comforts we wish we had, it's going to drive us further into needing Jesus. And that's going to be the place that we find comfort and encouragement and calm for our needs. He is our daily bread. He is the wellspring of life. We're not going to put all those things onto our community and say, you need to make me feel this way. You need to fulfill my preferences. We're going to put all those on Jesus and say, Jesus, you're the only one that can satisfy what I need. I'll hold fast to the, to the word of life because nothing else gives me life. My pastor doesn't. My church doesn't. My government doesn't. Nothing satisfies me like you do, Jesus. That should lead to a parish glad and rejoicing as we together enjoy Jesus and our mission should go forward into the world as a light in dark places. That we want our love and self-sacrifice to bring them Jesus. And so as we move forward in these days, we're going to be doing that. We're going to be giving up things long held that we loved. In order for the sake that the orthodoxy which we have lost so much to maintain would go out into the world saving them most broken and the most needy, like us, with the good news of Jesus. Amen. So I bless you, beloved. Oh, how you are loved and cherished by our Savior and by me. Bless you with the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Just keep